All How right. you doing today, Brian? Well, you know, it's uh, it's another day. Uh, it, so many of these have just kind of mushed together, having been home for so long. But um, it's day one thousand of of the <laughs> pandemic or whatever. But <laughs> right. Well, we had a great great conversation today with David Campbell, also called DC. DC is how I've known him for a couple of decades now. But uh, you know, just a very intelligent uh, entrepreneur, uh, longtime uh, security technologist, and someone who, you know, he's got uh, an intelligence that exceeds far beyond uh, just those domains that uh, he's operating, operating in from a professional level. Exactly. It, w- it was a great interview. We went everything from, you know, being a tech founder, you know, cultivating talent culture all the way to you know, talking about his favorite book. So it, it's going to be a great diverse episode for our listeners. Absolutely. And I was really pleased that we were able to get him on the show. Yeah, no. And with that, let's uh, let our listeners get on with the show. Let's do it. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Lead.exe. I'm Brian Comerford in Denver, Colorado. And I'm Nick Lozano, Washington, D.C. And today we're joined by DC, David Campbell. Uh, a, uh, a, <laughs> I don't even want to start with a title because uh, we just had a conversation about uh, the, the shift in uh, what titles uh, really mean and the relevance uh, in the evolving Web 3.0 world. Uh, but uh, David uh, has been uh, a longtime uh, uh, entrepreneur and uh, uh, security export expert in the world of technology. So, uh, welcome DC to the program. Thanks, Brian, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Good to meet you as well, Nick. All right, thanks. Thanks for coming. So, DC, it would be great to start off with a little bit of your background. It is very diverse and varied <laughs> over many years, and I know that you came up really from uh, more of the security perspective in technology. Uh, early on, uh, and that still plays a role in what you're doing today. But uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where you started and how that's led to what you're doing today with Electric Coin Company. Sure. So uh, I became interested in technology from a very young age uh, and remember my mom putting me in a, a programming class as like a first grader over the summer, writing logo code on Apple computers. Uh, and then my old man uh, brought home a, one of the first IBM PCs and I started taking it apart and really trying to figure out how it worked. Uh, I was big into flight simulation even at a very young age, but I realized that the computer really couldn't do an adequate job of, uh, of rendering a flight simulation without increasing memory and really tuning the operating system. Uh, so as a pretty young kid, I figured out how to do that stuff and just got bitten by this curiosity, this innate curiosity of wanting to explore Uh, And that really, really caught fire when I got a modem. So the ability to connect my computer to other computers just really cracked my world wide open uh, and and allowed that curiosity to flourish. Um, So I I continued that interest uh, through high school, got a job running like ThinNet, coaxial, uh, Novell Netware, network cables uh, for office buildings um, and learned you know, really basic client server networking uh, way back when. Uh, went on to university and studied uh, computer science information systems at uh, University of Colorado. Uh, and that was when the internet was really starting to, to change the world. Uh, back then it was all really text, uh, but the internet protocol really hasn't changed uh, since then. This was in the early 90s and the, the IP protocol we all use today is really uh, fundamentally the same as it was then. Um, but I, I had a knack for discovering weak spots in these systems. I would want to understand how it worked. Uh, I would sort of probe at the edges of my understanding and frequently find, oh, that, that's unexpected. I wonder what happens if I do this. And that really is what became uh, known as hacking and then later cybersecurity, which was basically just hacking, uh, but with a conscience uh, and with the desire to responsibly disclose what you found uh, to the system operators and network operators so they could fix those problems. Um, so after university, I took a job with a big consulting company called uh, Anderson Consulting, later changed their name to Accenture. 
Um, and that was interesting because they, they didn't have many people that understood this sort of nascent practice of cybersecurity. So they sent me all over the world to basically just hack into stuff and tell folks how I did it. Uh, and it was great. I got to experience it sort of burst the bubble. I think a lot of Americans suffer from this sense that America is the center of the universe. And until you travel, <laughs> uh, you don't understand that that's simply not the case. There's a whole big world out there. Uh, I think it was John Steinbeck that said that travel is the best cure for xenophobia. Mm -hmm. And I know that mm -hmm. firsthand to be the case. I've lived and worked all over the world and I have a, uh, a deep appreciation for how people are different culturally, professionally, uh, emotionally. Uh, and I think that, you know, I've come home to raise a family here in the U.S. and love being in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, but there's not a day that goes by that I don't respect and appreciate you know, the beauty that we have here and the opportunity that we have here in the U.S. as well. Um, it's funny hearing you mention that because uh, that, that makes me recall that actually we first crossed paths, crossed paths in, uh, in Hong Kong, didn't we? That's right. So uh, I, know, I know you and I were both pretty heavily involved in the electronic music scene back in the day. And that, that's right. I think it's another example of technology. Technology really took over music uh, and changed the music industry to the point now where like, you don't even call it electronic music anymore. It's just music and it's everywhere. Uh, but a lot of folks that were into uh, computer science also became very interested in electronic music. So it was super cool to to run into you in Hong Kong and like, <laughs> hole in the wall club and throw down some break beats and some jungle. That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> uh, small world indeed. It is. That's great. So fast forward, uh, a lot of different consulting engagements, a lot of travel, a lot of technology. Um, I ended up starting a, a security consultancy after leaving the firm uh, and basically applying what I'd learned in the big four, uh, but to to my own practice. And that was really interesting. I liked being the master of my own destiny. Uh, and through that consulting practice, I was able to enumerate a number of opportunities where customers would have, I would see uh, a type of problem present itself across multiple consulting clients and say, wow, maybe there should be a product or a service to solve this problem. Uh, and that is what uh, gave rise to Junk Cloud, which was a, a venture back startup I did back early 2010s. Uh, um, and that was, I think, a, a good marriage of cybersecurity skills with this emerging phenomenon of cloud. Cloud has really taken over the world, and Jump Cloud was a, uh, a stab at making cloud security really easy. Uh, so I learned an awful lot going through that process. Uh, then went on to, to take a job as uh, the chief security officer at SendGrid, which was an email or cloud-based email services provider. Uh, and that CISO job is something that I had already want, I'd always wanted to do. Uh, and it's one that I think you, you do get PTSD from. The, the <laughs> modern CISO role is uh, frequently saddled with a whole lot of accountability, oh, yeah. um, but often not the authority to enact the change required mm -hmm. to proactively mitigate all the threats that you face. Now, I was fortunate enough uh, to have a great leadership team and board of directors at SendGrid that was really supportive and understanding of the, the sort of situation that we were in as a really fast growing company. Uh, and we invested pretty heavily, pretty early uh, in the, the tenure of my, my position there uh, to, to mitigate a lot of risk. But that, that CISO job is a tough job. When I hear uh, Alex Stamos, you know, taking a turn as CISO at Facebook, uh, I have a lot of empathy. It's, it's really difficult to secure these platforms that have become you know, of paramount importance. We now have a, a president that basically runs the country over Twitter. Uh, so Bob Lord, a friend of mine who was CISO at Twitter for, for a couple of years, a while back. Uh, Alex Stamos has gone on to take on a security chief type consulting role at Zoom, uh, which is the platform that, that we're using right now to do this call, uh, which I think is another example of him stepping into the breach uh, and just taking one for the team. It's not an easy job, but Zoom is a platform that has risen to prominence. It used to be sort of a niche tool that enterprise IT shops used, and now everybody's using it for everything uh, to communicate during COVID. And a lot of security problems are being exposed in the platform. So uh, it's, I think it's testament to, to Alex's character. He says, okay, I'll, I'll sign up for that and I'll go do that job because it's, it is not an easy job. I think that's a great point and one worth exploring a little bit, you know, and I think that's true. It can be said, about a lot of different roles in technology leadership. There, there tends to be, 
you know, this um, really dysfunctional sort of perception from the business world uh, and other business leaders in, in particular that, uh, that you're screwing up because something has been uh, exploited as a vulnerability, but then you're the one that's also on the hook to go fix it because no one else has that level of expertise. So I like your comment about PTSD. <laughs> I think I think it's about uh, the first time that I, I think I've heard that in relationship to a, a technology leadership role, but I think it's really accurate because it's, it is a very dysfunctional relationship in the sense that, uh, you're in high demand, you're absolutely needed for your talents, and yet you're always the one that's looked down upon <laughs> to some degree by your other uh, counterparts who, you know, feel emboldened in their executive leadership roles. Yeah, it's tough to be a technology executive. It's tough to be an executive that is not directly connected to revenue generation for the business. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's true of security. It's true of IT. It's true of financial operations. Uh, really, I think only the sales team uh, has that benefit of seeing that direct connection between their activity uh, and the, the top line uh, revenues for the company. So as a, as a technology executive, I always try to orient myself when entering a new situation and figure out, okay, how does this business work? Uh, what role does technology play in bringing revenue into the company? Uh, mm -hmm. What role does technology play in figuring out what the bottom line looks like. Where are there areas for improvement? Uh, where can we drive efficiency? Where can we get leverage? Uh, that, that concept of leverage is something that uh, I, I had drilled into my head by Yancey Sproul, who was brought on at SendGrid, uh, I think a couple of years before the IPO, but he came in as a very experienced public company CFO. And one of the very first things he did after getting oriented in our business was he said, okay, look, startup time is over. This is a real business now. Uh, and you guys are going to have to play your positions. You're going to have to stay in your swim lanes and you're going to have to figure out uh, how to get leverage over your functions because only through that leverage are we going to be able to make it uh, out on the street with the big boys and girls. Uh, and that, that really left an impression on me uh, because as an early stage guy, you have that propensity to just wear whatever hat you need to wear on that day to get through whatever's going on uh, so that you can hit payroll and try to get to that next milestone to raise that next round. Uh, so it's, there is a, a, an inflection point that you pass, I think at a certain stage in the company where you have to shift from that sort of man to man, you, you wear all the hats, play all the positions to, okay, we need to focus on this specific function. We need to understand how it interacts with the other functions in the business, uh, but really drive to, to create leverage and efficiency. Yeah, very well said. And that's, I think that's another thing that uh, is interesting and worth exploring from an entrepreneur perspective, that wearing of many hats, you know, that's, uh, that's just something that, that comes with the territory of, uh, you know, putting every effort into getting things up and running for a startup. Uh, so what are some of the measures you think along that path that, that help to start identify what those inflection points are? Well, in the beginning, uh, it's all about figuring out, is there something there? Uh, and I, I spent a lot of time, I love that early stage, that crucible stage where it's usually uh, some passionate founders that have come together and they have some idea. And maybe the idea is worth something, but you, you usually place the bet on whether or not to engage either as an investor or as an advisor or as a potential employee with an early stage company based on the charisma and the capability and the talent of that team. I think the team matters a whole lot more at that stage than the idea. Uh, but generally speaking, what, what I like to see is a really strong team that's super passionate about the problem that they're solving. And usually there's gotta be some sort of personal connection to the problem. So if they show up and they say, I wanna solve this problem and it's clear that they just wanna do it because they think it's gonna make them rich, that's something I'll usually step back from. Uh, but if it's a problem that they're solving, because they're personally connected to it, uh, that's, that's a big green check mark in my opinion. So I was working mm -hmm. with Techstars. I've been working with Techstars here in Boulder for a number of years as, a, as an advisor. Uh, and there was a team that came through a few years back where the founder CEO was building essentially a, a really mobile wheelchair uh, that was, had some automation, had some really unique capabilities to get over obstacles. Uh, but he was doing this because he had been paralyzed in a motorcycle accident years prior. And he was literally leaning into this because 
he wanted to make life better, not only for himself, but for you know, millions of other people like him. And that sort of passion uh, and that direct connection to the problem and you know, bringing that solution to the world, I think, is magical. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the next thing after having that passion, figuring out you know, what problem are you solving, is there a market for it? Uh, and do I have an efficient way to address that market? Can I get to that market without needing a, a whole legion of salespeople? Um, then it's a question of, well, how do we figure it out? How can we test and learn quickly uh, to figure out how we, can, how we can get product market fit? Is this the right product for the market that we're going after? Um, and that stage is also super exciting because you, you're starting to get a sense of, wow, there is a there there and there's promise and we're starting to see interest and people are, they're engaging with what you've built uh, and frequently they're paying for it. And you, you start working with this black magic thing of pricing and, and how do you package your offering and, uh, and you're starting to scale along the way. So I think by that point where you've started to find product market fit, that's when as a founder, you need to start getting serious about hiring people smarter than you. Uh, and you need to get serious about delegation. You need to trust this person that you've just hired who's smarter than you in some domain to go do their thing uh, and you can't micromanage them. You've got to give them sort of a long enough leash to let them flourish and shine. Uh, but you're still at that phase going to be very much involved in a lot of areas of the business. And I know CEOs that have gone way past that point, raised hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, definitely have a massive market, you know, huge revenue numbers, but they're still directly involved in tons of areas of the business. And I always wonder, like, how long can they keep that up? How long until the board pulls the plug on them and brings in a professional CEO uh, and switches things <laughs> up. But there is something to be said for that, that CEO that's so passionate about the business that they just want to be involved in, in all corners. Um, I think the next major inflection point is you've got, got product market fit, you've got a scalable way to go to market and you're, you've got revenue growth. Uh, at that point, you're probably thinking about uh, making your product uh, multi creating multiple products that are beneficial to that same customer base uh, so that you can cross sell to that customer base. Um, and there, there will come a time where you have to then think about efficiency and leverage and think about, okay, do I need to bring in somebody who's really good at operations? Uh, frequently uh, finance and HR are two functions that are frequent. They're very often overlooked specifically by technical founders. And so, uh, culture is one of these things that's just quintessentially important for any business to survive beyond that early passionate founder stage and into the scaling company stage. And there's a question of like, well, what is culture and how do you create a culture? And uh, Ben Horowitz wrote a book recently. Uh, I think it's You Are What You Do, I think is the, the name of the book, uh, where he tries to address this problem of how do you build a culture. And what's interesting about Ben is that He's this very successful West Coast VC. He like built Web2, uh, but he is big into hip hop. So he'll always use references and like little anecdotes uh, of these rappers that he hangs out with to drive home these points. And he actually, it was quite a good, it's not your typical business book. Like you pick it up and you're like, oh, this is going to be super dry. Uh, but he, <laughs> he refers, he tells the story by, uh, he, he drives home the point by telling the story from a bunch of people that he's interacted with along the way or, or figures from history uh, that have been effective at building culture and then applies that to a more corporate uh, environment. So it's really important to think about culture early. Uh, and I think the biggest lesson on culture that I would share with you guys is that culture is not what you say. Uh, culture is how you behave when you think no one is watching. So your employees will soak mm. this up and they will, they will, it's like having children. Your children will not do uh, what you say. They'll do what you do. So you model right. this behavior that that is true at home yep. and it's true in the workplace. Uh, so having a good culture is, is super important uh, as you scale. So it's not um, just about ping pong tables and microbrews. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Are I'll you talking back, about for your stuff. children or? <laughs> yeah. the, the ping pong and beer, it, it can help build connective tissue. But I think it's going to be really interesting to see how culture in professional organizations shifts uh, in the wake of COVID. So I'm one of these people that's been watching this COVID thing with this sense of, wow, history is happening. So I've, I'm old enough now to have seen these paradigm shifts in society. Uh, the most memorable one 
uh, that we all remember was 9-11, which mm -hmm. really changed a lot of things about the world. Uh, and so with, with this COVID epidemic, I think we have seen a shift away from meet space congregation. We see a shift away mm -hmm. from practices like shaking hands with people. Uh, and a lot of people that have never needed to be effective collaborating remotely now need to be. Right. Uh, and it's been really interesting to see this happen because we've been, my, my present organization, we've been completely decentralized and distributed since the beginning. So we've already been living on Hangouts and Zoom and Slack and uh, we just, we're, we're good with that. But watching other folks try to get on board with that, uh, it's, it's a pretty steep hill to climb, but it's, it's working. And so I think mm -hmm. for COVID, mm -hmm. even after there is, uh, the spikes go down and even after there, there may be a vaccine at some point in the future, I think that I don't believe that society will ever return to working the way it did before. And there are a lot of drivers for this, but uh, one is as it relates to talent acquisition. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how to attract, uh, develop and retain the very best people, because that is a, that is probably the biggest competitive advantage you can have over your competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you are narrowly scoping your funnel of who you can recruit uh, based on a particular geography, you're cut off from, from a huge talent pool. Yep. So the ability to just find the best people and make them work wherever you are, wherever they are, is a massive competitive advantage. I think uh, Corey Doctorow wrote a, a book many years ago called Eastern Standard Tribe, which was talking about this sort of hacker culture and uh, really working towards, he was describing a, a future in which everyone was working remotely. And the one thing that you can't change are people's circadian rhythms. So I think in the future, we're still going to see hiring be sort of filtered uh, in certain ways, but I don't think it'll be based on geography. I think it'll be based on time zone. There are, there are mm -hmm. time zones that are workable for distributed teams and there are those that aren't. Uh, so there's a company called Argent that's building a, a very, user centric, uh, high user experience, uh, Ethereum wallet, a crypto wallet right now. And they're, they're based in Europe and their policy is we'll hire you wherever you are, so long as it's in Europe. And I think we're going to see that model coming up more and more because mm -hmm. trying to coordinate, mm -hmm. uh, across, you know, a 12 hour time difference is very difficult, but yeah. this need to like be in San Francisco or to be in San Mateo or to be in Cupertino, <laughs> it's just, it's, I think very outmoded. And increasingly impossible, <laughs> just based on housing. <laughs> right. It's possible to live there, yeah. Right. <laughs> so I want to ask you, like, as we're talking about this COVID pandemic, right? And I remember back in January, I was on LinkedIn, and there was this Forbes article that was pretty popular. It was all about remote working. And I saw this comment on there where this guy was, I'm not going to say his name or anything. I'm not trying to public shame him, but he said, you know, remote working was invented by the millennials because they like to stay at home and waste time. Mm. Um, and I'm just like, well, you know, have you ever been to an office? People waste time there too. They don't need to be remote to do that. <laughs> it's like, uh, but as we're talking about this paradigm shift of, of going remote, um, one thing I've noticed is that as teams are going remote, they're trying to shift their same work practices and daily habits into a remote box and it doesn't seem like it works right. They want to have the team meetings that they always have, um, but they want to meet four times a week because they don't see each other in the office. And I feel like it creates this zoom fatigue um, mm -hmm. or any kind of like remote work. I feel like it, it can be fatiguing, right? If you're trying to adapt the main office thing and you're using teams or Slack and you're pinging people constantly. Mm -hmm. So you've seen like you've been pretty successful working remotely. Like what kind of tips do you have for leaders well, who are just kind of, getting into this, making that transition? I've, I've worked with folks that have very strong opinions about this on both sides. So uh, I'll give an example from SendGrid where the company was founded in Boulder. It came through Techstars Boulder, but the founders were, two of them were immigrants uh, and the three of them all lived in Southern California. So we right out of the gate had a, an engineering office in Southern California in Orange County. Uh, and then the headquarters in Boulder uh, later opened an office in Denver and then uh, a larger office in, a, in Irvine in California, another office in the Bay Area. So we already had this need to be effective at working collaboratively across great distances. Uh, and yet we committed to this initiative we called One Colorado, where we closed the Boulder office uh, and we set up a transport company, literally running a Google style Wi-Fi bus to drive the Boulder people down to Denver every day so they could be there in the kitchen, 
in you know playing ping pong, drinking pints, and having the water cooler experience with the folks in in Denver. Uh, and it was it was tricky. Uh, and I think if we hadn't already had that need to have the the connectivity to the California offices, that one Colorado initiative may have been very successful. But in retrospect, I think we spent a lot of time and a lot of money and displaced a bunch of people uh, and didn't really get a lot of benefit for that. I've seen other organizations and technology leaders, founders, very successful people that I admire and respect a lot uh, that have stood by even until very recently around, no, I've got to have my people in the office. We've got to have that, that FaceTime. Uh, we've got to have the, that connective tissue. Um, and they're, they're being forced to change their thought process now because of COVID. Uh, I think that the companies that have been most successful at being remote are those that were really an, an intentional and specific about it. So a good example of a Boulder-based company that was remote from the get-go is a company called TeamSnap. Uh, so Dave DuPont, I believe, is the founder CEO there. And they were just 100% remote from the beginning. They did have a small office in downtown Boulder, but they were very intentional about creating an inclusive culture such that if you were that person on the other end of the the hangout, you didn't feel like an outsider. Uh, and I think that, I think Dave actually built a culture where even if you were in the office together with other people, you would split out into these breakout rooms and join the hangout separately uh, mm -hmm. in order to make the folks who were remote feel like they were uh, completely part of the, the same team. Uh, so I think building that culture of inclusiveness is important. Etsy is another example of a company that had a big office in Brooklyn back in the day. And they, I think, were very intentional about working hard to make remote people feel, feel included. It matters. Uh, you need to provide time to make sure everybody has a chance to speak. Uh, it, and I think the more intentional you are about it, the better it'll go. Now, in terms of this, this guy saying that millennials just want to work from home because then they don't have to like, put on pants and they can walk their dog whenever <laughs> they want. Uh, okay, but I think what we're seeing here is a move towards greater work-life integration. So in the old days, we talked about work-life balance. And uh, today we talk about work-life integration. And I've got, got five kids at home. So there's always something I need to be doing to be keeping the family on track. Uh, the ability for me to duck out and take care of something when I'm working from home is, I think, very, very helpful. Uh, and does it mean that I'm like not butt in seat working an eight hour day, nine to five every day? Yes, it does. Uh, but does it mean that I'm less effective? I would say, no, it doesn't. So contrast my life now where I'm working largely from home uh, to when I was taking the Wi-Fi bus to the Denver Sengrid office every day. That would be like an hour each way that I would pretty much lose uh, that I now have the ability to use to integrate uh, work and life together. Now, is it hard to get stuff done when you're being distracted? Yes. Uh, do you need to carve out an environment in which you can be productive? Sure. Uh, but you can be incredibly distracted in the office and not just by people breezing by wanting to talk about what you're doing this weekend, uh, but the, the notifications like mm -hmm. Slack. Uh, wow. It's IRC on JavaScript with persistence and boy, <laughs> is it distracting and it doesn't get rid of email. You still need email. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the constant barrage of distractions, that's going to happen no matter where you are. And so what we need is to teach our people to have discipline, to teach them to suppress notifications, to time box uh, chunks of, of their week, to go through and deal with that, that stuff, uh, but to learn how to be productive and effective because the modern workforce is going to be distributed. It is going to be decentralized. And those that fight that, I think are gonna be swimming upstream. It's, it's a losing battle. You know, you mentioned earlier, Ben Horowitz and you know, his book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things is my favorite book ever on performance management. And I, and I heard you say it as well, you know, uh, sales is one of those only domains where your work effort is directly correlated, right? Your performance is specifically measured just by the activities that you're doing. And, and that domain is sort of unique in, in the business world in that way. Right. But what, what I just heard you saying, you know, really about focus, I mean, all of those other things are key themes in performance management. And performance management is not some kind of draconian, you know, we're going to apply metrics to everything you're doing. It's really about outcomes. And so, you know, a lot of what I'm hearing you say right now, it's about the shift in perception to outcomes, right? Mm. Whether or not you're getting things done on, you know, 
eight to five, uh, as long as the things that you have committed to are getting done, they're getting done effectively and uh, according to the outcomes that the expectations are tied to, right? right? Then, then really, what the hell does it matter? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's super important to, to focus on outcomes. Uh, we had a, a pretty mature and experienced HR department or people operations department at SendGrid. Uh, and I think they worked, they, there were some really solid business partners in that organization that helped managers run an effective performance management uh, function. Um, at the Electric Coin Company, we're just much smaller and we're distributed, we're decentralized. And we also employ a lot of brilliant cryptographers uh, that have never had a traditional job. Like they're literally this beautiful mind type people that very few people on the planet understand the things that they do. So the idea that you would ask them to like do their TPS report and fill out their performance <laughs> management evaluation, it's a tough sell. Uh, but I think we have been successful. We did have people when I joined the company a few years back saying, hey, you know, I've never had a review. How am I doing? Uh, what's next for me? How do I progress? Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things that I'm, I'm pretty proud of is the success we've had at implementing uh, a performance management program that looks a whole lot different than what was will work for us at SendGrid, uh, but I still think it, it does a good job of helping people know where they are and where they're headed. Uh, and one of, the, one of the interesting developments we had fairly recently in the past year at Electric Coin is we had an employee uh, who's a sort of a new manager in the organization, uh, a guy by the name of Brad. He came up and he said, hey, you know, I, I wanna be a bigger part of how we're doing strategy here. I wanna be a bigger part of how we're doing planning. And at the time, we were sort of doing scaled agile. We were sort of doing waterfall. It was somewhere in between. Uh, and I think it was a point of frustration for our folks. And so Brad showed up at our leadership team meeting and he said, hey, I wanna do OKR here at this company. Uh, and that was not an easy sell because we've got a founder CEO who's pretty skeptical about metrics. There's this notion of the tyranny of metrics and uh, Goodhart's law, which says that anything that people are measured against will ultimately be gained. Uh, so we've been very intentional about, as we've rolled out this OKR process within ElectroCoin, making sure that we're being focused on outcomes. Uh, we're trying to be as quantitative as possible as we set our key results uh, for each quarter, but we're also uh, judiciously applying judgment to ensure that we're not falling prey to that tyranny of metrics. Uh, it's, it's easy to focus on the wrong things, to let those vanity metrics sort of become the focus rather than the actual outcome that you're trying to track to. Uh, but I'm really, really pleased, particularly because this, this OKR implementation that we've done, it's pretty lightweight. It doesn't piss off our genius cryptographers too much. We've, we've been real intentional to try to make it super light uh, and integrate with, with their workflow. And it's not perfect. We've got some, some kinks to iron out. Uh, but I do think it helps people understand what is our strategy from a multi-year planning perspective. What, you know, where are we trying to go and why? Why do we care? Uh, but then boiling that down into uh, priorities for a quarter and then making every team understand how their objectives line up against that strategy and how they're contributing. I think that positively contributes more than beer or more than ping pong to positive employee engagement. People want to know every day that they show up that they're making a difference uh, mm -hmm. and that their work is noticed uh, and that they're, they're appreciated for what they do. So I'm, I'm real proud that we did that and even more proud that it was the idea of one of our people, not something that came down from the ivory tower of leadership. And how much of that is just being a good communicator, right? You hear about you know, metrics and everything, but it's, it's also communicating to your team what these metrics mean and mm -hmm. what your intention is behind it, right? Yeah, I think that that matters a whole lot. Uh, we went through a, a period at Sangrid where we became very data-driven. We had a whole uh, data warehouse team and a, a BI layer on top of that. And it was difficult at times. We, we had a separate uh, financial planning organization that really had a, it was an amazing organization that was able to forecast our revenue like a year out within a few dollars. Uh, and this is millions of tens of millions of dollars worth of revenue. <laughs> so trying to layer on a, a BI solution onto that, trying to get all of the executives thinking about metrics in the same way, trying to connect that with our long range planning, uh, trying to connect that to board level conversations, but then also trying to make that usable to the people in the trenches as they were making decisions about how they ran their functions uh, over time was, was pretty challenging. Uh, I do think that data is good, 
but data must be, you must apply judgment to data. Uh, and then you must like explain why this data matters and what, what you're going to change in response to the trends you're seeing in the data uh, and how often you're going to revisit it, uh, when you might pivot or change plan. Uh, we made some, at Sengrid, we made some dangerous decisions based on data. So we had an, an initiative to uh, basically radically increase the efficiency of the sign-up process. So we had an exec that was pushing for this and it sounded great. It's like, who doesn't want our customers to have a more frictionless onboarding experience? Well, I tell you who didn't. It was the folks responsible for keeping the spammers and the fishers off the network. So in the quarter that this thing went live, this new frictionless process, our numbers were just off the charts up and to the right. And there was a, a few weeks of everybody clapping each other on the back and talking about how kick-ass a job we had done. Uh, but then like, I don't know, a quarter later, we saw that 90% of these new super fast conversions were fraught. Uh, and we had to unwind all that. And I think that's a, I learned a lot from that experience, which is that you've got to apply judgment to metrics. Uh, you know, there's an adage in, in management, which is that which is not measured isn't managed. Okay, great, I get it. Uh, but you also need to apply judgment because just because you're seeing something go up and to the right, it doesn't mean that you're getting the business outcome that you want. That's a great point. And, you know, judgment is just, it's, it's one of those most critical things. And it's something that unfortunately doesn't come, uh, you know, naturally as common sense also tends not to until you've actually had some experiences <laughs> to reinforce uh, where that's coming from. Right. Sure. DC, I want to ask you a little bit, uh, kind of jumping tracks here. So with all of the dramatic changes that we have seen just in a matter of months and record numbers of unemployment, uh, you know, I mean, really nothing like we've ever seen before, not even the Great Depression, right? Now is probably a great opportunity for entrepreneurship. But most of the folks who are unemployed are also not the types of folks who, you know, typically a lot of these roles are service oriented roles, right? They're, uh, they're not necessarily, you know, folks who have been out there trying to carve their own paths, uh, unless you take into account things like, you know, folks who have picked up on, um, you know, Uber and Lyft drivers. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of folks have really taken advantage of some of the, the social, um, entrepreneurship opportunities that are out there. So from the perspective of, you know, if you were sitting in the unemployment line today, uh, you know, what steps do you think you could be taking to probe and explore where those entrepreneurship stones could be overturned? Sure. So I think if I were standing in the unemployment lines today, uh, and if I had one lesson or, or something to teach, my, my colleagues that were there with me, uh, I would say that going straight for entrepreneurship from the perspective of I'm going to have an idea, I'm going to go find a co-founder, I'm going to go raise some money, and then we're going to build this product, and we're going to get billions of users, and then we're going to have an IPO. And I would put that aside. Uh, and instead, I would focus on looking at macro trends in how the relationship between employee and employer is changing. And what I'm seeing there is that the days of the employee having a one-to-one -one relationship with an employer that persists over a long period of time are long gone. Uh, that's, the, that's the world our parents grew up in. That's the world that started coming undone you know, halfway through my professional career to date. Uh, and instead, what I would tell folks to focus on is lean in uh, on the technology side. Uh, lean in on uh, figuring out what sort of unique capabilities you have as an individual. Uh, Naval Ravikant talks about this as specific knowledge. So Naval does a great series uh, podcast that I think is poorly titled on how to get rich without being lucky. But putting aside the corny <laughs> title for a moment, there's a lot of really good stuff in his, in his podcast. And what he says is that if you basically figure out what you enjoy doing, and then you figure out what you're actually good at in that domain of things that you enjoy doing, and you build up a discipline of getting better and better at it over time, you will innately and intrinsically become successful. Like you just need to work hard. You need to be working on something that you enjoy doing uh, and something that you find that you have a bit of an edge on because you're passionate about it and you care. 
uh, that, that I think is a magical recipe for success. Now you combine that with some of these novel platforms. Uh, there's one that is based in Boulder called Gitcoin. It's uh, gitcoin.co. Uh, and the idea here is they've created a marketplace to incentivize open source software development. So if you go to Gitcoin and you've just taught yourself some JavaScript or some CSS, uh, you are able to look at open bounties that are posted by employers that are seeking a many-to-many -many relationship with developers, engineers, designers, uh, marketing people. You don't need to be a coder to participate in this ecosystem, but uh, I think instead of kicking it on the unemployment line or waiting to get, you know, waiting for Lyft and Uber to come back online so you can make Travis and his band of folks rich while you, you know, do all the driving, uh, it makes a lot more sense to create some marketable skills to seek out novel platforms like Gitcoin and others that allow you to get paid for your contributions uh, without needing to have a, a sort of marital style relationship with a single employer. That's great. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah, you bet. You know, I'm also curious, you've, you've spent a lot of time in mentorship yourself and uh, Galvanize is one of those uh, domains where, you know, really taking people from maybe having a curiosity or an interest in the world of technology to actually being skilled and being able to transform, uh, you know, what they're doing. I mean, that's, that's something that I know you've, you've had, uh, you know, uh, an involvement in for quite some time. I'm kind of curious as well. I mean, I think a lot of folks who today find themselves trying to figure out what's next on their horizon, they, they need to understand, you know, where can I, where can I start to get uh, some education that's going to really help me transition uh, right. into looking at something different. So, so brutal honesty time. Uh, I've, I've hired an awful lot of people. And while I have had some folks come through these bootcamp, uh, like retraining type programs, um, I sense that not only for folks graduating from those programs, but for all of Generation Z, uh, they tend to be missing some fundamental understanding in how things work. And I think it's related to a lack of curiosity. So Mm -hmm. We've created this generation of people that they're just consuming content, they're on their device. The device itself is a wall garden that they can't develop software on even if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're trained, we're, we're creating a culture of teaching these children uh, to just be consumers of content, not producers of content. So the boot camps are good. Uh, I think that they do teach people that they can learn new stuff. Uh, one of the things I, I I hate hearing the most is, oh, I'm not technical or I don't code. Everybody can code, right? You may not be writing moon math cryptography code, but you can figure out how to do hello world in JavaScript. You can figure out how to build a single page web app that looks okay. Anybody can do that. Uh, my, my word of advice to Galvanize and the other uh, folks that are running these bootcamp accelerators is try to work harder to encourage your students to build that foundational knowledge. Uh, an old friend of mine by the name of Dennis Cruz uh, he wrote a book that he published as an open source, like free to download book called Generation Z Developers. Uh, and in this book, he talks through, he's, he's about my age and he's had a lot of experience working in technology and hiring people coming up. And he's also a father. So he's seen with his own now teenage kids, how they've got this disconnect between all the time they spend on the device uh, and their ability to actually create and produce on these platforms. So it's a, it's a short read. It's only like a hundred pages. I'm actually in the process of creating a pull request uh, to add some additional content to his book because it's this <laughs> new model of, you don't publish a book and it's done. You publish a book as open source and anyone can contribute to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he unpacks a, some of these themes and also provides a checklist of technologies that they don't teach you at Galvanize, uh, but they really should. Uh, and it, it's also, he spends some time trying to teach folks why these fundamental building blocks of technology matter and how they work, but not in deeply technical terms. Like, sort of, you know, skin deep, uh, but important concepts for people to understand. So you don't take for granted things. Because if I, if I hire a developer who only knows JavaScript, they're going to really struggle to, to thrive in an environment where I really need them to understand, at least at a, a basic level, how the rest of the stack integrates with what they're doing. Uh, so I'd, I'd really like to see the boot camps focus a little bit more on some of that foundational stuff rather than diving and only focusing on uh, that, that higher level code. That's good to hear. Thanks for that feedback. So we're coming up close to our time here. And I want to make sure we ask the question that we ask all of our guests is, is there a book or a piece of media that's had a big impact on you at all? 
So I, I love reading. Uh, I don't read as much as I used to. And I think part of that's a function of having a bunch of kids. Part of it's a function <laughs> of the phone as this universal. There's always a way to get distracted on your phone. Uh, I do have an iPad that doesn't have anything on it except books. Um, and that's, that's a really good way to, to read for me. Uh, but one of the books, and I'm going to jump way out of the business context here for a moment, but one of the books that's had the greatest impact on me over time is uh, Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was given this by my parents as a 12 year old or, or so, and it tells the story of uh, Siddhartha coming from a place of privilege, uh, but finding himself deeply unsatisfied with his existence uh, and going through a lot of self-induced suffering to really find himself and to find his place in the world. Uh, and I think that's, that lesson is really important for, for me, uh, being a, a successful entrepreneur, living in this paradise place of Boulder. There's a lot going on in the world right now. There's a lot going on in America right now to shine light on uh, systemic inequality, on sort of scale injustice and the, the problems with the system that we've created that make it very difficult for people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and to gain uh, an equal playing field with the rest of, of the people in this country and on this planet. Um, so I, I think a lot about uh, gratitude. Uh, I think a lot about the role that hard work has played in my success, but I also think a lot about uh, the, the role that my parents played uh, in getting me to this place. My father was the first of his family to ever go to university, uh, and I don't take that for granted. Um, but the, the lesson I learned, tying this all back to, to Hess's book, is it's this notion of life being a journey. Uh, it's this notion of being conscious of your privilege, uh, not becoming spoiled by it, but using it ultimately to your advantage to help others. That's really uh, the lesson I take away from that. Uh, and the, it's the, the path I try to, to push forward on in this world. That's a great recommendation. And it's, it's probably one of the shortest of Hess's works as well, but that doesn't mean that it, uh, it lacks in the density uh, that's, that's packed into that particular story because there is a lot to contemplate in, uh, in, in how the story is put together. That's a great recommendation. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Thank you. And if people are looking for you online or, or anywhere else, where can they find you? Uh, so Alchemy DC on Twitter. Uh, I'm also going to give a shout out to keybase.io uh, slash alchemy DC, trying to make uh, public key cryptography useful for the masses. Uh, keybase <laughs> was recently acquired by Zoom, so it'll be very interesting to see uh, what happens there. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Awesome. Uh, maybe Alex has some plans for that, right? I think so. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, DC, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an enlightening conversation as it always is with you. And it's just a pleasure to have you on the show. Really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Yeah, happy to be here. And I uh, look forward to hearing you on the radio here before too long, Brian. Uh, and great to, to meet you as well. Nick. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Thanks, DC. Thanks, guys.